Hello and welcome to Data Research Labs. For today's Advanced Excel Quick Trainer, we're going to discuss the forecast sheet feature. The target audience is students or those working in the science or engineering fields. For faster viewing, put your play speed on 2x or jump to the chapters of interest in the timeline below. First up, what is the forecast sheet? So what is the forecast sheet feature? Well, let's start with the definition. Excel forecast sheets start with historical time-based data from a source worksheet. So here on the right, we have a two-column worksheet. That's our source worksheet, and it's historical time-based data. It's got a time series there in column A, 1-1 to 2-1 to 3-1. They're all consistently a month apart, and there's the corresponding sales in column B that we're using to seed the historical data so that the forecast model can predict future data. That source data is moved into a new target sheet that the forecast feature builds. And here in the example on the right, our original date and sales, columns A and B, got carried forward, but then columns C, D, and E get added. And we'll see what that looks like later in the presentation. This is done to predict things like future sales, consumer trends, etc. And you can see in the graph that's created, the blue line represents the historical data, our source data. And the orange line is what the forecast sheet feature is all about. It's predicting what the future sales will be based on past sales. So what statistics are behind the forecast sheet feature? Well, it uses the AAA version of the exponential smoothing algorithm, specifically the whole winters algorithm. Uh, the AAA stands for the first A is additive error, the second A is additive trend, and the third A is additive seasonality. So it's factoring in errors, it's factoring in trends from extrapolating on the past, and it's, it's adding in seasonality, where you have periodic ups and downs. When Excel, the uh, forecast sheet function, generates sheet number two, it pulls forward columns A and B, the original source data, and it tacks on columns C, D, and E. And for column C, if you go look in the formula fields here, it's the uh, forecast feature actually wrote equals forecast.ets with a bunch of parameters. It used this function call to actually generate the dark orange line values there, the predictions. And likewise, the upper and lower bounds, the lighter orange lines here, they, those values were generated with the forecast.ets.confident, confidence interval function, and that's how the confidence intervals were calculated. And one final thought on the statistics behind the forecast sheet. According to Wikipedia, it's a rule of thumb. And that's why it's really more for finance and less for science. So what are the assumptions behind using the forecast sheet? Well, the most important one is that the timeline column must have regular intervals, be it days, weeks, months, years, whatever. They have to be uniform and consistent. The prediction model is based on that. You can't have one row to the next be a month here, a quarter there, a year there. That'll mess up the forecasting model. So the timelines have to be regular intervals. Second assumption is that it's best for this model if you use seasonal or repetitive patterns in the data. Not for, Don't use it for linear modeling or something else. Use it for typically sales data where quarters or months are higher in some areas than in other areas of the year. Third assumption, if no pattern exists, the tool will revert to linear and it won't do any seasonal ups and downs. It'll just do a straight line and fit it. Uh, fourth assumption, it handles, the model handles incomplete data sets up to 30% via a setting inside the application that we'll look at here in a minute when we go to run it. And you can tell it what to do with the incomplete data. You can tell, can tell it to use zero or use an average, etc. And finally, the fifth assumption is that the tool or the model handles duplicates via an aggregation setting, and we'll see what that means later too. Next up, how to use the forecast sheet. So, how do you use the forecast sheet feature? Well, let's start with a simple run. First, you highlight your source data. It has to have two columns: a date column, like column A on the diagram here. And column B is our data. You have to have a data column. So that's what your two source data columns look like. Then you go to the menu item data, and there's a forecast section, and in it is a forecast sheet button. You click that. 
that will pop up the forecast worksheet dialog and it'll give you a preview of what the graph's going to look like. Hasn't done anything yet to the underlying worksheet, but the dialog pop up is showing you, hey, this is what it's going to look like. And then you can select the forecast end date. There's a picker there. It defaults to a certain whatever. It, it cut off here at 9 1 2013 and it went forward two years to 9 1 2015. It just naturally did that. It, but you can change it. You can override and click the button. There's also some options. We'll review those in the next section. There's a bunch of options you can manipulate. There's also a bar chart view. We go back. Default is a line chart. Blue is the historical data that you're going to base the trend off of. Orange is the prediction, the future, the forecast data. When I'm up here and I click this bar button instead of the graph, I get bars. So if you want bars, you can do that. Just click that button. For different view. And finally, you click the Create button. And we'll see in an upcoming section what the output looks like after clicking the Create button and how to interpret it. But first, we're going to explore the dialog options here in this uh, Options button. Next up, how to use the Forecast Sheets dialog settings. So if you click the Options button here on the Forecast Sheet dialog, it'll pop up all these different options and expand the section. And the first one here is the forecast start date. That's the date on which you want the forecast to start on the graph. That's where you want the orange line to start and the blue line to end. Some considerations for the forecast start date. If the date you pick here is less than the end of the historical, then only the data prior to your forecast start date will be used for the blue line. And then the orange line will pick up from there and and move on. So you'll actually discard some of your source historical data if you pick a date earlier. Another consideration, if you start too early, you'll become, you can compare the predicted versus actual. So that's nice. You could do an initial graph and show the blue line longer and then come back and, and, and see how the actual data flows for 10 or 12 periods. And then you could back off and set the forecast start date back 10 or 12 periods and see if the predicted matches what the actual source data was. And another consideration, if the historical is too short, you thin it down to two or three or four periods, then you're going to get a bad trend, especially if you don't have multiple seasonal fluctuations represented in your source data. So don't pick a forecast date that's too early. Give yourself enough seed data, historical data to forecast off of. And finally, if the data is seasonal, you may consider starting a forecast date not at the end of the available data, but at some natural boundary, like the end of the year, the first of the year, whatever makes sense for the given data that you're studying. The next option in the list is the confidence interval. And if you check that, it'll display the confidence intervals. That's the default. So you'll get the upper and lower thin orange lines. If you uncheck it, it'll hide the confidence intervals and you'll only get the thick orange line, the predicted value. And what is the confidence interval? Well reads as 95% of the predicted values will fall between the upper and lower bounds that are predicted. The next option is seasonality. It's the number of time series steps before a cycle repeats. The default is auto detect and you should usually leave it at that but if for some reason you want to manually override you can do that uh, but if you do make sure that you set it to three or greater don't set it to one or two. The Excel documentation says that if you set it to one or two the algorithm's not going to function properly. The next option is the Include Forecast Statistics checkbox. If it's checked, then the output will contain a table with seven measures in it. It'll have three smoothing coefficients, alpha, beta, gamma, and it'll have four forecasting model accuracy values, these four down here. And we'll discuss what these are and what is a good value and what is a bad value in the section below on interpreting the results. The next option is the timeline range and the values range. And think of the timeline range as the column A that we were looking at earlier, the dates, and the values range, that's the values, the dollars that we are predicting or forecasting. And there's those two. These are always going to be defaulted because 
before we ran the four, before we clicked the forecast sheet button, we highlighted the two columns. So they're here if you want to change them, but they should already be filled out. The next option is what to do with missing points. Do you want to fill them? Do you want to fill them with zeros? That's going to impact your forecast. Or do you want to fill them with interpolation, where there's a weighted average so long as less than 30% of the total points are missing? My suggestion would be clean your data before you run it through this. But if after cleaning your data, you still have some missing data points, fine, then you can choose. Interpolation is the default, and it works pretty good. It basically smooths out that missing data. But if you put in a zero, maybe you have reasons to do that. If you do, note that it's going to impact your forecast because it is going to use that zero. So if, if there really was supposed to be a value there, let's say 30, and then it was a zero, well, that's going to pull your forecast out of whack. But maybe there's reasons that you do want to be zero, and if so, you can choose that. And likewise, if you have duplicate values, the same time period, uh, March of 2020, and you have two rows with March of 2020 in there. Well, a time series forecast expects one value per date range, date item. If you have two rows, well, it, it, something has to be done with the duplicates. And by default, Excel will average those two values, but you don't have to average. You could take a count, you could take a max, a min, a median. You choose what operation you want to have happen to that duplicate but average default looks good. And again, like the prior missing points, clean your data, <laughs> dedupe it before you run through the forecasting. That's the proper way to handle it. But if you can't, this option's available. Next up, how to interpret the forecast output. So after clicking the create button from the prior dialog, Excel will crunch the numbers and produce a new sheet, in this case, sheet two. So we started with sheet one, it had two columns, a date and sales, and it went through row 34 and that was it. This new sheet two copied that data forward and added a bunch of rows and columns. It added rows 35 on and these columns. So there's our sheet number two that's created. There's our original source data, rows one through 34, columns A through B pulled forward. Here's our new forecast data rows, 34. Now 34 overlapped, it doesn't have to, but in this case it did. So there was an actual seed historical data there, and on the same row, there was some projected data starting. But uh, column C, D, and e, e are added. C, the forecast sales, is the dark orange middle line. That's the best guess, the forecast, the prediction. Columns D and E are the lower and upper confidence intervals, where it's adding a value and subtracting a value from the dark orange that represents uh, 95 percent of all of the data predicted should fall within those bounds. Uh, it, Excel tacks on this help note and the help note is basically saying hey you can manually go down and edit the forecasting formulas. So Excel didn't just generate this graph it actually generated all the data that builds a graph and it used the following functions, the forecast.ets for column C, and then C35, which is this guy, which is the dark orange bar, it adds and subtracts the confidence interval amount from C35. That's what these are. So three cells, C, D, and E. And that's all that this forecast sheet note is saying. The output also includes a graph Blue line is the historical data. Orange lines are the predicted forecast data. The graph has x-axis being the time that you input uh, right up to there. And then the forecasting extrapolates and extends. So if I was, well, the data was monthly, but the graph is showing it quarterly just because it can't fit that, that many monthly data points in here. But the extrapolation keeps going with monthly data points all the way out. And then the Y uh, axis is the value, the dollars. Talked about blue being historical. We talked about the dark orange being the predicted or forecast value. And the upper and lower confidence intervals 
are the thinner orange lines and they represent the that 95 percent of the future points predicted will actually fall between those orange lines when the time arrives next up how to interpret the optional statistics table so how do we interpret the forecast output specifically the optional statistics that are located in columns g and h if you check that when you are setting up the options so we see in column g is the name of the statistics a statistic the alpha beta gamma mace smape etc and then h is the value at the end after the model or the forecast has been run so the first one the alpha parameter is a base value it has a range of zero to one and the higher the value is closer to one the more weight is put on recent values beta parameter is similar but it's based on the trend value range zero to one higher value more weight for the recent values when predicting the future values and finally the third parameter the gamma parameter is a seasonality value also a range of zero to one and a high value once again means that when it's predicting it applies more weight to the recent seasons than the prior seasons moving along to the four metrics that are used to measure the accuracy of the prediction the maze metric is the accuracy of the forecast it is the mean absolute scaled error maze and a maze greater than one implies the forecast is worse than a naive method and a maze, which means you shouldn't bother the forecast then, just do the naive method. And a maze of less than one implies that the forecast is better than the naive method. The SMAPE metric is also an accuracy metric, but it's accuracy on the percent of errors. And it, SMAPE means symmetric mean absolute percentage of errors. Uh, I took a lot of this information from the Excel help. You can click through and read it yourself. It has a range of zero to one and I assume I Google all over and this is one I couldn't find much information on I assume that a low value means it's more accurate why because it's a percent of errors and the less errors you have the more accurate it is so I would assume that closer to zero or zero is a good thing the MAE metric is the size of errors it's the MAE stands for the magnitude average errors and low is better but is 45,000 low or high? You can't tell. Well, actually you can. You compare that 45,000 to the millions of dollars per month that were entered for the uh, sales and the projected sales. So 45,000 is a small fraction of millions. So low is, that is low. And that's, that's how you use that metric, that big number. You compare it back to the data points, the predicted points. And uh, finally, the RMSE metric. It's the difference between the predicted versus the observed values. It's the root mean square error, or MSE. Low is better, and once again, you compare the size of the, uh, the RMSE to the size of the actual data points. Next up, example number one, taken from the business field. It's how to forecast a sales trend. So on my worksheet here, for example number one, the business or financial model where we're going to forecast dollars into the future. I set up data that is very similar to Microsoft's own help file on the topic, at least the first year's worth I entered from them, and then I did a formula just to randomize some data. But uh, I've entered a date column, and it's one month intervals. There's no variance from that. They're all nice and consistent. and. I went down 34 rows to September 1st, 2013. And then I have sales, plopped in some numbers there. So I'm all set up. I have what I need to do a forecast. I have a time series date column and I have some value column. So let's forecast the next two years in sales. So I'm gonna highlight the data, that's how I'm gonna begin. So control, I hit my anchor cell here and then control shift down and then shift to the right. Now I have my two columns all selected. And then I'm gonna to go to data and the forecast and the forecast sheet. And up comes the dialog box. And I look at my blue data, yep, seasonal. And then it's gonna predict and project off of that. So forecast statistics, yeah, we'll check. Let's see, I'm gonna expand the options. <laughs> I have a small screen, look at that. That's kind of a bug for Excel, interesting. There should be a vertical scroll bar here. I'm on the small laptop view. 
Anyways, and I probably, ugh, nuts, I can't. Oh, there it is. I can just barely get a hold of it. Nope, I can't. <laughs> I guess I won't click that include. I could always go to a bigger screen, but whatever. Here, I'll move it to my other screen, and then I'll check it, and then I'll move it back. And you can see I can hold the window just long enough, and you can see it's checked. But if I let go of the mouse, then it drops off anyway. Funny. Uh, everything else I'm going to leave as a default. Oh, nuts. There's a create button. I'm going to roll up the options there. Now I can actually get to the create button. So I'm going to click create. And when I do, watch. I have one, two, three, four worksheet tabs down here. I'm going to click create. And bam, it created a new sheet one. I don't want it there, though. I like it ordered to the right here. Hey, there we go. And I don't like that name. I want it to be run number one or example number one. And what happened here? Well, Excel took my original data, put it in the new sheet, right down through column 34, and then Excel extrapolated out and guessed what the next time points would be, one month apart. And then it also did its predictions here, in these columns. And then it graphed all of that. Blue, these two columns, and then the orange were these three columns. And you can see the statistics table that I kicked, clicked the checkbox on. And that is what the forecast sheet looks like. And finally, example number two, taken from the healthcare field, how to forecast the COVID-19 spread. So I found good sample data out on Kaggle, and I'll put the link in the descriptions below so you can go grab it out of the YouTube <laughs> descriptions. But uh, it does healthcare related data it's and, it, and it's time series data. It's the COVID-19 global rates for the pandemic in 2020. So it starts out in January 22nd and has the daily total confirmed counts all the way down. It only goes through October 17th. What is that? Three point. No, that's 39 million confirmed cases. And so that's a nice time series data. And if you've been watching the news, you see all the project projections where they have an upper and a lower bound on what the likelihood is of the infection rate over the coming months. And we'll just do that ourselves here with Excel. It'll be fun. We'll have a pseudo scientific use for the forecast sheet. So here's the data pulled in for global, not any one country, but the global data. And we want to highlight the two date. So we don't care about country. We'll ignore that. We could graph deaths or recovered, but I'm going to graph these two. I'm going to graph date and total confirmed. Control shift down. So I got columns B and C with all the data, 271 days worth. Ready to go, all queued up. And then I go to my data menu item, forecast, forecast sheet, click it, and bam. I have the blue data curving upward with all the total confirmed infections. And then the orange, it's projecting out, I don't know, 2020, it's projecting out to the end of the year, which is in the past. Right now it's early February of 2021. But it's projecting out and it's giving us the upper and lower bounds. But it's not done yet. Let's play with this. Uh, the forecast end, go ahead and click it. And this is interesting. Uh, watch what I do. I'm going to just go forward, forward, and all the days in the month are black. But at some point, forward, click, click, I can't go any farther. I can't go past July of 2021, and I can't go past July 14th. And I spent some time trying to figure out what's going on there and see if I could find a rule of thumb. On example number one that we just did, over here, the maximum Right, right here, you can eyeball it and look and go, oh, it's about double. The orange is about double the length of the blue. So the blue is 10 months, and then you tack on, well, nine months, nine months. Yeah, because that was almost February. So anyway, what it comes down to is that, for example, number one, I could extend the time 1.56 past what my baseline date range was. So on example number one, I took the end date minus the start date, 
got some time period. Whatever that time period was, times 1.56 was how much further out I could project into the future and forecast. For this model, it's 1.0. It's almost exactly double. So whatever this range is, I can put the exact same amount projected out into the future. And I Googled and couldn't find a reason behind that. I, these are daily increments. The example one was monthly. I don't know if that has anything to do with it. But the easy way to figure it out is just to click, 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 right as far as you can go and pick the biggest date. There you go. You'll get your maximum projection if that's what you're looking for. Now that I have this set up, I'm not going to go into any of the options. I'm just going to use what's here and click create when I do. There's example two. And we have a sheet two that's created. I don't like that position there, so I'm gonna move it, and I don't like the name, so I'm gonna double click and change the name to run number two. And here we go. We have our forecast thicker orange line. We have our upper and lower bounds where we know that 95% of the actual data will fall between those ranges. And look, as the time gets further and further out, of course it gets wider. And this model's not gonna be aware of vaccines or any of that kind of stuff that's not built in all it's doing is saying here's the historical trend if nothing else changes here's what's going to happen so kind of interesting there's our historical data and then if i control down i'm at row five row 271 is where the projected data starts thank you for watching and please if you found this video helpful click like and be sure to subscribe below also be sure to check out our related videos in the boxes to the left.